special part of the lecture. We've got somebody that knows what they're talking about, okay? So this is Hannah, okay? Now, Hannah is a current Welsh 48 kilogram champion, okay? Uh, she's also a former British champion and a current snatch record holder, okay? Now, she was recently in Malaysia for the Commonwealth Championships, and she won a silver, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, she's also won two silvers and a bronze at the World University Championships in Mexico, um, and she's hoping, and I've got my fingers crossed for her, to compete in the Commonwealth Games for Wales in 2018. So she's really at the top of her game. Now, Hannah's actually coached by Ray Williams. Okay? Now, he won the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh in 1986. So she, you know, she's trained by somebody with pedigree. He's also a former World Masters champion and won silver in the European Masters in 2015. Um, he was a captain of the army for a long, long time, and he's the current head coach of Welsh weightlifting as well. So, you know, we're talking about people that are at the top of their game, that have many, many years of experience, they know what they're talking about, and Ray Williams in particular has coached lifters up to Olympic standard, okay? And as Hannah describes him, he is the best coach, okay? So I'm not going to talk any further, I'm going to hand you over to Hannah, so please enjoy this part of the lecture. Hi, I'm Hannah, as I may have said. So I've been asked to come and do this lecture for you guys just to give you a bit of um, perspective on what strength training is really useful for. Um, I know I find it, I'm a year three sports science student, and I sometimes find it hard to apply the science to something that is like, practical. So I'm hoping that this lecture helps a little bit with that. So um, I did a little slide just to talk about who I am before I start. So. Um, I've been lifting since I was 11, I'm 24 next week, so it's a long time. Um, yeah, I started lifting at school, um, <coughs> I've won British Championships and I've set some records in that time. Um, I used to lift for England and I've, I've switched recently to compete for Wales. Um, and yeah, everything else I've already been mentioned by Amit, so I'll move on. So I just want to start off with talking about what Olympic weightlifting is, um, because when I tell people that I'm a lifter, they're usually quite surprised. Um, first of all, I'm 4 foot 8 and I weigh 47 kilos, so I'm not your typical idea of a weightlifter. Um, so Olympic weightlifting, the aim is to lift as much weight as possible from the floor above your head. Okay. Uh, the snatch technique and the clean and jerk technique um, I use in competition, which I'll go through after this slide. Um, it is different to powerlifting. I know there's some powerlifters in here. Um, so powerlifting involves a deadlift, a back squat, and a bench press. Um, and there's lots of different federations for powerlifting, and you can lift in equipped and non-equipped, and the powerlifters could uh, explain that better than me. Uh, weightlifting is governed by one international uh, federation, and just includes the snatch and clean and jerk. Uh, men and women compete separately. Um, there are lots of different weight categories which I'll touch on later as well. So I'm obviously in the smallest one. Uh, and weightlifting is basically made up of power, speed, strength, gymnastic like movement and technique. Okay. Oh, before I move on, uh, the picture is of Zoe Smith. She is one of Britain's most uh, successful female weightlifters. She is only 22 now and she's been to Commonwealth Games. She won the last Commonwealth Games in 2014 um, and she went to the Olympics at age 18. Uh, she missed this year's Olympics due to injury. Okay, so snatch technique. This picture demonstrates a snatch really well. So um, if you start at this picture here on your right and go across each row, um, then that shows you the progression of the lift. So as I mentioned before, this is the snatch that's used in competition. So you aim to lift the bar from the floor overhead in one movement here, so there's no break. Okay, so in competition you have three attempts at snatch. Um, the aim is to snatch as much as you can. If you fail the weight, then the weight remains the same, or you can opt to move it up. If you achieve the weight, then there's a minimum increase of the January of two kilos, uh, which has to be added on, but generally people tend to skip five, five or more kilos. Okay. So 
So if you fail to make a snatch, then you can't complete, uh, carry on into the clean and jerk, which is the second part of competition. So again, this is a progression of the lift. So once you've made a snatch, you move on to the clean and jerk. And again, the same principles apply where you have three attempts to make a good clean and jerk. If you fail a clean and jerk, um, if you fail all three, then you're disqualified from the competition. And again, if you fail the lift, the weight either remains the same or you can opt to increase it. And it's up to your coach to declare increases in weight. Okay, so I've got the saying, yeah, in competition, you have two hours uh, between weigh-in and competing. So it's not like boxing, I think they get like 24 hours maybe. Um, you literally have two hours. And some lifters will decrease their weight by like eight kilos before they compete. So it's a huge loss um, of weight for some lifters. Um, two hours is not a very long time to replenish. And also if you're, uh, weigh-in depends on your lot number in the group. So if you're the last person to weigh in, uh, you're gonna have less than two hours then to replenish before you compete. So it's quite a high pressure situation from the beginning. Uh, during competition, there are three referees and a jury table who are looking for the slightest error in technique uh, because you don't just fail lifts just by dropping the weight. There's a lot more to it than that, unfortunately. Um, two coaches per athlete are usually allowed in international competition in the warm-up room. The lifter has one minute between the time their name is called um, before they have to begin the lift. And weights must be declared and signed for within 30 seconds of the lift. Um, the lifter having the minute time to complete the lift. So everything happens really quick in the warm up room. Um, there's lots of tactics played. Um, there's a very short amount of time to make decisions. So it's a, it's a very, very competitive game um, at international level. Um, so I've got a list here of other reasons why uh, a lift may be failed in competition. Okay, so a press out, which is probably one of the most irritating uh, ways to be failed at lifting competition for lifters. Um, when the bar is overhead, the elbows must be fully locked out. If there's any movement in the arms at all, then the lifter uh, can have that lift taken off them. So they don't necessarily drop it, they've just bent their arm and then straightened it quickly, and that's a no lift. Okay, oscillation is quite difficult to explain, but basically, between a clean and a jerk, there has to be uh, separation. So they're two different movements. Some lifters will try and use the bounce on the bar as they come out of the clean to give them a little bit extra into a jerk, which is not allowed. It can be quite hard to spot because I'll show you a clip in a minute, but lifts happen very, very quickly. Um, elbow to knee touch in a clean, so um, I'll show you a clean position in, in the lift in a minute, but if there's any contact between the knee and the elbow, that's also no lift. Um, stopping the bar during the lift, um, if you drop the bar before the down signal, so uh, some lifters get carried away, so if they've got the lift, it's all good, but if the referee hasn't given them the down signal and they drop it, then that's a no lift. Also then dropping it, because you can't hold it both heads, so no lift. Uh, releasing the bar above shoulder height, so in competition you have to follow the bar down past shoulder height. Um, poor etiquette, so if you're swearing or seem to be disrespectful, even things like kicking the bar on the platform, which some of us do out of frustration, the referees uh, can take the lift off you as well. And also if you're timed out, so as I mentioned before, you have a minute to complete the lift. If you don't start the lift within that minute, then, then it's a no lift. Um, you only get three lifts in competition. You really can't afford to waste lifts when you're competing for places because quite often there's a kilo difference between a gold medal and well the, the, I won a bronze medal in um, the world university championships and the gold medalist uh, was only one kilo ahead of me in the total so it, it can be very very fine um, okay so they use lights in competition so you must receive two <coughs> white lights out of three uh, for it to be a good thing Okay, so the male bar weighs 20 kilos. So if any of you train in canals and brails, then we have this equipment up there. Um, female bar is 15 kilos and it's slightly narrower. All bars have grip and knurling on them. Uh, disc 
range from 0.5 to 25 kilos, and currently the minimum increase in competition is a kilo, which is going up to two kilos in January. Um, in competition, we always have to use collars, and they weigh two and a half kilos. Um, and a competition platform has to be four by four meters square. So that, the top picture, a lipo, that's generally, it's like the world-class brand of equipment that we use. Um, and the picture just there is just showing you that Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, we lift in weight categories. These are the categories. So men's weightlifting group starts 56 kilos, which is about 8.8 .8 stone, I think, um, up to 105 kilos plus. So some guys are like 170 odd kilos uh, when they compete. Uh, women start from 48 kilos, which is my weight class, which I think is about 7 stone two or something. Um, and Currently goes up to 75 kilos plus, but those are changing. We're getting a couple more added in, so it'll be a 90 kilo plus category. Um, I think the heaviest female athlete at the Olympics last year was about 135 kilos. So some are huge, and then some are like my height. So there's a whole range. Um, generally, weightlifters tend to be quite short, um, and ideally short limbs as well, but you do get variation. Okay, so another slide to help put some perspective into what world-class weightlifting is like. So the snatch technique, which is from the floor straight overhead, uh, the world record for 56 kilos is 139 uh, kilos, um, and his best clean and jerk is 171 kilos. So he's lifting 26.9 stone from the floor above his head, weighing eight stone. <laughs> Uh, with nothing but his own body. Uh, for the women, uh, so best clean and jerk at 48 is 121 kilos, which is 19.2 stone, uh, weighing what I weigh, which is absolutely huge. And then the, the highest clean and jerk is 193 kilos for a female lifter, which is just insane. Um, I've got another quick video to show you. This is the 56 kilo world record clean and jerk of 171. This guy is the same height as me. <laughs> Okay, so I just got a few uh, little points up here. 
So uh, one study by Garhammer says that heavier lifters exceed published maximal power output during brief exertion. Okay, so the, the stage which follows just after this picture where uh, the hips come into the bar and the, the bar is forced upwards, that is where maximum power output occurs. Um, so here, I think Chris Hoy's max power output in one burst is something like 2,700 watts. Okay, and here, max recorded power output of a weightlifter, he was about 142 kilos, I think it was about a 260 clean, uh, 4,758 watts of power in like 0.01 seconds or something. So, um, the power that these athletes have is huge. If you are interested in looking at the studies, they are quite interesting. I, I posted them up there for you. Okay, so weightlifting as strength and conditioning. So the transfer in weightlifting goes to uh, many sports, power-based sports. If any of you are ever interested in coaching, strength and conditioning work, um, anything where you're working with athletes to get them stronger, I can guarantee that uh, Olympic weightlifting will, will feature somewhere. Um, so the picture would be half penny there, doing what looks, I would guess, as a power clean. Um, and the same with Jess Ennis. So most athletes will use uh, some variation of Olympic lifts in their training um, because weightlifting uses speed, power, flexibility, everything that any power athlete needs. Um, so it's the perfect sport to, to use as a strength. Um, exercise and strength element in a training program. Okay, I have to put a bit of physiology in for you guys, the physiology lecture. Um, so, weightlifting is a power based sport. Okay, um, that generates explosive, powerful movements, um, huge exertions of force to shift the weight. So, obviously, we're then using ATP and PCR energy systems, and uh, also um, during training, not necessarily in competition, but you, you would end up also working that anaerobic glycotic system. Um, it depends what part of training that you're in, which I'll touch on as well. Okay, so high energy phosphates are stored in the muscles, so creatine. So <coughs> creatine supplementation uh, is great for weightlifting. Um, the only issue is for those who have issues with making weight, they wouldn't use creatine supplementation. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, some lifters could cut like eight kilos to compete. Most will sit about five-ish kilos heavier. It depends what weight class they're in. Um, I'm in a fortunate position where I'm light, so I've never had to cut, but I know that cutting is horrendous. My boyfriend has had to do it plenty of times and he's not uh, too pleasant to be around when he's doing it. So, most athletes, when they're cutting, when they start their cut, they're already pretty lean. Um, so by the time they're down to the weight that they compete at, they, they've lost a lot and maybe they're also starting to lose muscle. So creatine supplementation, not something they would do because although they're training to get strong, they're not necessarily training to put on muscle mass. So there's a difference between uh, training to put muscle mass on and then training just to maintain the strength you've got or increase the strength you've got in the muscle that you've got already. So making that muscle more efficient. So you might see a difference in a weight class where you've got a really short lifter who's very stocky and very muscly. They might not be as strong as the slightly taller and slimmer athlete with less muscle mass. It's just the way that um, how efficient their muscle is and also how efficient their technique is. So weightlifting is not just about strength, it's very much um, a balance between strength, mental strength and technical efficiency as well. Okay, so a little bit of training information in. So training cycles are made up of sections that determine the load and intensity. Weightlifting is not like athletics where we have off seasons, so we compete all year round. Um, so for us, it's a case of selecting the competitions that we consider important and then programming to those um, and only lifting, uh, only lifting to peak a couple of times a year. So we're not the kind of athletes that will peak every week 
for the whole of the summer. We might only peak three times in a year, and all that training we've done in that year, will, will, the expectation then is to increase your total in, uh, in certain competitions. Okay, so I've just put up a really, really rough, um, quick example of what a training program might look like. So you've got week one where you do a really, really low intensity of 65 to 70% of your best lift. Then week two and week three be slightly more. Uh, week four and week five, again, the intensity would increase. For the last two weeks, you'd be lifting uh, to 100% plus in preparation for competition. Uh, in the week leading up to the competition, we taper off. So we do the bare minimum and just tip over and then uh, we should be in absolute peak condition for that competition in that week and that's where you aim to see all the work you've put in the last potentially six or eight months of worth of training. You want to see it in those six lifts that you get on that day. So it can be a high pressure. Not much reward for the amount of training that you do in weightlifting, maybe. Okay. Um, some examples of uh, training exercises that we use. So you've got the snatch, the clean, and the jerk, which are the classical lifts. Then you've got the variations on those lifts, which are in the um, table. Okay, and then on the side, I've just put just a few of the other types of training that we will put in to our session. So uh, what you have in your session depends on what your coach deems is necessary for you. Um, so if any of you ever going to coaching, or if any of you coach now, then you'll know that building a program is really central to that individual athlete and their needs. Okay, and uh, a lot of this stuff is, is what any athlete or uh, anyone who goes to the gym would use. Um, I know how I was talking earlier about reps and stuff, so obviously in the low intensity, high volume end of weightlifting, uh, with these kind of exercises, we might be doing like eights and tens, which is a lot for weightlifters. Um, in the variations, three to five reps max, which is high volume for us. Um, singles and doubles are what we do at the, the end of our program towards competition. Um, but weightlifters are not are not built for endurance, so if you uh, got a weightlifter to do a, a circuit and gave them high reps, they would fatigue very quickly because of the energy system that we've kind of fine-tuned over our years of lifting. Um, so we might not look that fit, <laughs> um, but the transfer into our actual lifting is what's important for us. So um, it's slightly different to how other athletes will train, I guess. Okay. Stuff about rest and recovery. I think a lot of people who um, maybe train themselves uh, maybe don't quite realise how important rest and recovery is. So the stuff that I'm here just talking about, um, how your body recovers from training and stuff, that stuff happens when you're resting, not when you're training. So some people have this idea that they have to train all the time and absolutely hammer their body, but if you're not giving your body the, enough, the right amount of time to recover, then whatever you've done in that training, you're just kind of carrying it over into your next training session, and you're not getting benefit. So I used to train 11 times a week when I was full-time, um, and I really noticed that I wasn't recovering very well at all, um, and I was plateauing, and uh, I just didn't feel very strong, <laughs> despite the amount of training that I was doing, and and the tonnage of weights that I was lifting every week, I wasn't quite getting the return of it in training. So what's really important if you ever go into coaching or you're working with athletes is that recovery is a key thing. Okay, so I've listed some things here um, that can be used for recovery. I have two rest days a week. Um, maybe at certain points of my training program I might only have one. But that extra day, I won't be doing anything crazy. It'll be more like active recovery. Um, so some athletes use like swimming, walking, or gentle exercise as active recovery. I prefer to just have a total day off. <laughs> but um, sleeping well, athletes need to sleep more than regular people because we're doing more to our body. We're causing a lot more damage, so we need a lot more time to recover. 
distracting and mobilizing, which is something a lot of British weightlifters have not really paid so much attention to in previous years. And it's something now that through sports science and uh, the involvement of sports science in our federation that we're now being told the importance of stretching and mobilization. Massage, icing, staying hydrated, eating well, and just generally chilling out when you're not training um, is really important. So athletes will probably try and have as little stress in their life away from their sport as possible, uh, which is something you'll find if you ever work with athletes, is that they don't want stress from other areas of their life. <laughs> okay, nutrition. So weightlifters eat a lot to fuel their training. Um, an increased muscle mass equals an increased metabolic rate at rest. So basically, uh, whilst you're just sat down here, if you have high muscle mass, you'll be burning more calories than somebody who has low muscle mass. Okay, high protein for recovery, protein synthesis. I know this was touched upon earlier. Um, protein and carbohydrates after training is recovery. It's something that we're just taught through our sport, but like was also mentioned earlier, not necessarily protein shakes. Um, you don't necessarily get in your protein shake what the front of that tub says. Um, and also a, a real issue for athletes like me who are subject to drug testing is that a lot of protein shakes come from companies that are not regulated. Um, they're not batch tested. They don't care what they put in your protein shake. They just want you to buy it quite often, not always, not all protein companies, but some, because there's hundreds of protein companies out there. Um, so a really high risk for me is taking a supplement and it being contaminated with something, and then I then fail the drugs test. So generally, I don't really take anything um, because the risk is actually that high. Um, healthy, balanced diet. So weightlifters tend to eat more calories than the recommended daily allowance because we do more, our bodies are doing more. Um, good hydration. So each lifter will have their own specific needs. So I'm a lifter who's now going to be working with someone to put weight on, uh, whereas the majority of weightlifters will be working with someone to help them keep their body weight down. Um, and it has to be done properly because if diet is kind of messed about with um, and if cutting weight's done poorly, then it has potentially catastrophic um, consequences on performance in competition. I've known lifters that have literally starved themselves for a week, they've eaten nothing, and they're also completely dehydrated to the point where that they can barely function and they're just trying to make weight. And they're sat in the sauna for hours the day before in the morning of competing. They haven't eaten for three days and stuff. And that's a really bad way of cutting weight, but some of us do it that way. Okay, supplements. So as I said, I don't really take anything. I take vitamin D um, and omega-3, and that's about it really. I, I supplement with creatine as well now and then. Um, but generally, it, it's not something that I use that much. Again. Protein shakes, if I'm really desperate because I need to eat something after training, then I'll have one. But it wouldn't be the first thing that I go to if I have other options. Okay, so weightlifting is one of the oldest sports in the Olympics, although it's changed a lot in terms of what uh, techniques are used and the structure of it. Women have only been allowed to compete in the Olympics in weightlifting since the year 2000. So it's really not that long. So for women, weightlifting is still a, a fairly new, a fairly young sport. Um, and I have this video to finish off. So I have been too long. Um, it's quite a long video, um, but I think it shows the all aspects of, of weightlifting and how great the sport really is. Not that I'm biased. Okay. So it's in German, but there's English subtitles, and the story to this is just amazing. Uh, but for anyone that's interested in the sport, not just weightlifting. <laughs> Mit der 
vor der Entscheidung stand, ob ich jetzt überhaupt wieder anfange oder ob ich es einfach bleiben lasse, war, war mir dann klar, ähm, wenn ich es jetzt bleiben lasse, dann ist dieses Geschehene trotzdem passiert. Das ändert sich nicht mehr und es wird mich mein Leben lang begleiten. Olympiasieger an dem Tag, das habe ich auch gesehen, aus, aus Deutschland. Überraschend, das war auch so, den, 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 hat den Ziegern noch, glaube ich, den Australier überholt und wurde Olympiasieger und ich bin, äh, war für mich dann so, so, auch so, so ein Ding, hey, heute ist ein guter Tag und äh, das Ding, Computer zugeklappt, raus und alles noch irgendwie geschaut, dass ich alles mit habe, nochmal konzentriert, äh, von Tape über Schuhe, alles dabei und dann gehst du in, ins, äh, in die Halle. Und viele machen ja auch dann die Musik noch weiter und das war ich bewusst dann nicht. Also ich habe alles dann zu Hause gelassen und weil ich will, dass ich will diese Atmosphäre spüren. Wenn ich die Musik höre, bin ich abgelenkt dann. Also wenn ich sie direkt dort ich die Halle, wenn man da reinkommt, dann ist schon so eine Grundlautstärke von den Leuten da. Die Gruppen vorher waren noch dran, man hört auch eine Handel, du gehst dann zum Wiegen, dann sitzen die Athleten da, die gucken sich grimmig an. Das ist wirklich ganz lustig. Wir sind, das gebe ich dem schon ein bisschen schräg, weil das ist nicht so, dass man sagt, das sind jetzt lauter so Freunde unter sich. Dann du setzt dann dahin, da sitzen wirklich lauter so Bären da und, und, und gucken dann. Wobei ich mir dann immer gedacht habe, wenn ich so beobachtet habe, die können noch so cool und so hart aussehen, weil sie das, was sie tun, haben sie urmenschlich ausgesehen, aber ich habe so immer das Gefühl gehabt, die sind trotzdem da. Und dann ähm, lief der Wettkampf eigentlich sehr, sehr gut. Ich habe äh, mit 198 begonnen, was 2 Kilo oder 3 Kilo der Bestleistung ist. Und 223 Versuch war schon Bestleistung und dann haben wir es. 2007, und dann bist du schon mit deinen Reihen dabei. Und ich war so überzeugt, dass ich nicht kann, dass ich kann nicht bin. Das habe ich so ausgemacht. Ich war ich glaub, ich glaub aus aus diesem Wettkampf. Da war keine Russe 210 gewesen, ich glaube, der Wettkampf 207. Das waren auf jeden Fall drei Athleten vor mir, ich war vier dann am Reisen. Man musste das ganz schnell machen. Ich war immer noch im Kopf beim Reisen, was ganz, ganz fatal ist. Und äh, da liegt draußen 235 Kilo, also noch wieder in der warmen Halle auf. Ich gehe da ran, ich setze sie um, ich springe die Hand raus und kann sie nicht mehr ausstoßen, muss sie fallen lassen. Und dann sagt der Trainer, Matthias, wir müssen raus, 246. Also wie raus? Wir haben gerade 235 Kilo, ich konnte ich gar nicht, wie soll ich das? Ich gehe gar nicht, ich habe keine Luft mehr, überhaupt nichts. Wurscht, wir müssen raus, wir haben keine Zeit mehr, du bist dran. Das ging so schnell, das war Schlag auf Schlag. Ich gehe dann an die 246, ich setze die um, bescheiden, ich stoße aus und wir fallen die hinten runter. Der erste Versuch ist stoßen. Und für mich war immer klar, stoßen ist meine Königsdisziplin, meine Schokoladenseite, die kann ich immer gut und der erste Versuch ist nie ein Thema. Da brauche ich gar nicht groß nachdenken. Im Reißen musst du dich konzentrieren und stoßen. Das war für mich schon schlimm genug, aber das ist immer schlimm, wenn ich mich nicht verstehe, dann halte ich mich nicht verstehe, was machen wir? Wieder hoch oder weitermachen. Also weiter steigern, weiter steigern bedeutet wieder in Lasten. Er wusste ja, ich bin vorbereitet auf sowas, aber er wusste nicht, was ist denn jetzt in dem Moment los mit ihm? Kommt er mit der Hecke in der Klar, was ist mit dem Steiner los? Da, da ist wirklich so, so du hast ja gemerkt, auch er wird dann nervös. Also er hat aber, erst versucht, nicht ruhig zu bleiben, hat mir daran eingeredet, dass er, du weißt schon, dass du eine Medaille hast damit. Wie? Mhm. Du hättest schon beim ersten Versuch eine Medaille gehabt. Das war mir gar nicht bewusst. Ich dachte, beim ersten Versuch habe ich keine. Das war klar. Und dieses Wort, Medaille zu haben, für den Versuch, war für mich dann so, ach du Schöne jetzt alles reinstecken in diese Untersuchung, egal was hinterher passiert, den, das musst du machen. So sie waren noch nicht ideal, aber sie waren gültig. Und es war mir klar, ich habe eine Medaille und für mich war schon so ein, so ein, so ein kleiner Verlast weg. Okay, ich bin auf jeden Fall Dritter, ich habe den Ausfall bei Olympischen Spielen. Toll, richtig toll. Der Russe 250 Kilogramm genommen und eigentlich war der dann weg. Der hatte 210 gerissen, 250 gestoßen, 64 im Zweikampf. Und ich stehe gerade mal da mit. Äh, okay, mit so now he's explaining that he's still 9 kilos away from a gold medal. Das ist ja sehr viel. But here in this coach decided to just put the weight on anyway and just go for it. Das war das Schöne. Also, ich musste nicht warten, bis alle Übungen Versuche machen, sondern ich konnte auf die Bühne gehen und selber den Versuch durchmachen. Und ich habe mir alles auflegen lassen. Den Tag, wo ich alles geschafft hätte, weiß ich nicht. 
jetzt willst du Gold holen. Du hast nur mit diesen, diesen einzigen Versuch. Und da habe ich mich auch erinnert und an, die, an die Worte von, von Frank Mantek, der mir ganz am Anfang, wo ich in Deutschland kam, gesagt hat, die ganzen großen Athleten sei mit eines aus. Die haben viele Wettkämpfe. Sie haben aber nur ganz wenige Wettkämpfe, wo es dann nur einen einzigen Versuch gibt, der über alles entscheidet und der das Leben auch verändern kann. Sie haben in ihrem Leben noch vielleicht zwei, drei Versuche, vielleicht auch nur einen. Den musst du aber machen. Und das unterscheidet die großen Athleten von den guten Athleten. Und das ist da auch mal mit dem Kopf geschossen. Das ist jetzt die einzige Chance. Die einzige Chance ist jetzt. Aber es hat gereicht. Und gerade auf dem Aufstoß, ich habe hab alle Gehörer deine nachgegeben, nur die Arme nicht. Die waren gültig. Also das war hier durch, das war gültig. Ich habe die Hand beherrscht und ich war dann nur ein Direkt nachdem ich oder wo ich die, 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 die Goldlast sicher hatte und wusste, die ist gültig, war das im Gefühl, dass wir nicht auf dem Kettchen wegspringen. Und erst dann habe ich gemerkt, welchen Druck hatte ich vorher. Ich habe ihn nicht wahrgenommen. Ich habe ihn nicht wahrgenommen. Ich glaube, das ist ja so normal, wie ich mich fühle, alles ist gut. Und habe es hinterher gedacht, das war ein verdammter Druck. Das war wirklich was Ich habe mir auch kurz schwarz vor Augen. Und dann aufstehen, obwohl ich beide stark war, das, das ging ganz kurz. Aber es hat sich alles wieder gefangen. Das ist ganz gut, cool. das sind die ganzen Gefühle, die weiß ich noch. Also das spüre ich noch, ich weiß noch, wie sie da lagen. Und ich habe so ein fallendes Gefühl, als ich sie über den Kopf hatte und ich wusste, noch vor den Kampf treten, die sind gültig, weil ich weiß, die haben keine Kontrolle. Und äh, ich habe mich losgezogen, dass ich nicht gewonnen habe. Und äh, da kommt das raus, was sich im Endeffekt die ganze Zeit unterdrückt. Aber das war, das war im Endeffekt so, so, ein, so ein Gefühl, auch das Danke, denn es kam mir so hoch, dass ich die Möglichkeit hatte, äh, ich bin das hier werden zu dürfen, das, 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 das war das war ein großer Moment in dem Mut und ich war auch der Punkt, dass, dass ich dann nur leider der gehe. Das war ein nicht so schöner Moment in dem Moment, weil ich wollte schon nicht dass man das auch weiß. Ich wollte eigentlich, ich wollte eigentlich nur, nur für mich der Welt zeigen, dass ich nicht da rein hochstehen muss. Thank you. 